Hello, welcome to today's episode of Juicing the Numbers, your statistics and sports podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Joshua Tracy. And I'm Corbin Heller. And I definitely remember to say my name. And welcome to the Monday night episode, Monday morning episode of the show. Uh, we're recording this last November episode, I think. Yeah. On November 11th, 28th. Shit, fuck me. About 7.30 here on the East Coast, uh, Corwin Heller. Uh, why don't we start with the, the college football coach news that you said you had for us? Sure. Because I feel like we uh, always say we'll do that later and then we forget and then we I never do talk about yeah. it. So. Um, I guess there's, I mean, there's some on here like uh, Louisiana's Billy Napier. Uh, is the new head coach of the University of Florida. Um, he was a former assistant coach of Florida. Honestly, just a pretty good prospect for what he's done at Louisiana, especially since Louisiana is not a national program, and they've done pretty well the last couple of years. I don't know much about him outside of that, so it's really hard for me to really give any other details. God damn, the big one is Lincoln Riley leaving Oklahoma before they leave for the SEC to go take over the helm at USC in Los Angeles. Uh, Lincoln Riley, the QB whisperer um, that turned Baker Mayfield into the first overall pick, that turned uh, Kyler Murray into the first overall pick after both of those guys kind of petered out at their first schools, uh, Texas Tech and Texas A&M, uh, respectively, and then turned Jalen Hurts into a Heisman candidate, uh, a first-round pick candidate, and he's turned in his career into a pretty nice one in Philadelphia. Um, obviously, with Spencer Radler and Caleb Williams there now, both of those guys, while not both super effective this year, um, Caleb Williams has really come on the scene and uh, both were very highly touted. So it's really hard not to look at Lincoln Riley and saying, and see just the guy who's finally capable of turning USC around. I mean, they have not been a team. They just haven't really been a serious national contender since fucking the Pete Carroll days with Reggie Bush and Matt Leinart and Carson Palmer and just, Lendale White. Um, I mean, I kind of want to pull up their past head coaching history just to see the outrageousness uh, that it was uh, these past couple of years. Do you know anything about, you know, what's been going on with USC? Do you know anything about what's been going on with, um, you know, Lincoln Riley or, or any of this? Or, or are you just kind of on the boat for the ride? Dude, I saw Lincoln Riley was, was trending on Twitter at one point and assumed that was a rapper. I get that. I, I have to constantly remind myself what the letters USC stand for and which coast it's on. Like, man, we are so far removed from the shit I fucking care about. I love that. Um, let's see. Lincoln Riley will be taking over. Uh, Jesus, who is this? Dante Williams, interim coach. Whatever, outside of 2019, 2020, and 21, I don't have those numbers in front of me. They've got records of 5-7, and 11-3, and 10-3 and with a win in the Rose Bowl, 8-6, and 9-4, and 10-4, and 7-6, and 10-2, and 8-5, and 9-4, and four. and that 9-4 and four was Pete Carroll's last season at USC in 2009. Prior to that, 12-1 and one Rose Bowl win. 11 and 2 Rose Bowl win. 11 and 2 Rose Bowl win. 11 and 0 Orange Bowl win. 12 and 1 Rose Bowl win. 11 and 2 Orange Bowl win. With two national titles right in there and the 2005 season that has been vacated where they still went to the 2006 Rose Bowl. So it's been a whole lot of shit outside of the handful of seasons where they were able to piece something together. The last three years, they have just been an absolute non-contender. Nobody really is scared of USC. Nobody is giving them any sort of uh, leeway or any sort of 
expectations for success. Um, it's just they're a program with all the funding in the world. They're funding with all the prestige in the world. They are a program that by all means should be an utter powerhouse as the only major school other than Oregon on the entire West coast. There's so many prospects there that they should just have their choice of. Um, And now they get a guy who by all means has been utterly exceptional since taking over as head coach at Oklahoma, having gone 12 and two, 12 and two, 12 and two, nine and two and 10 and two in his five seasons at Oklahoma gone to four uh, new year's Eve bowls in his four previous seasons Two are actually only one win in the cotton bowl. Um, but by all means, he's been having Oklahoma as a true playoff contender and uh, national championship contender each one of his years. So this is an, I can't imagine the last time there has been this kind of coaching hire and coaching change, maybe going back to Urban Meyer going to Ohio State uh, type of gravitas. Mm. So, yeah, that's what I got to say. I I know. I knew like two of those names. Pete Carroll and Urban Meyer. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah, I get it. And even even up until like last year, I would have only known Urban Meyer by name. Like if you showed me a lineup of mm-hmm. uh, dudes that look like not even dudes that look just white guys, like je- not even guys who look like Urban Meyer, just like white dudes. Uh, I still probably wouldn't have been able to pick them out because I, uh, I got yeah. that. If you put Urban Meyer and Lincoln Riley in a room together, got them pissed drunk, took them out the next morning and just put them in a six four six person lineup uh, it'd be difficult to tell them apart and the crimes they commit too well urban yeah i don't think lincoln's broken anything but hey he's a college football coach in america i'm sure he's done something plenty of time to disappoint so does uh does this mean anything like do you, it's always tough because it's not like clean pipeline from like college football to the nfl not everyone feels compelled to do that to themselves. And so don't Mm -hmm. plus the compensation at the college level is if you're doing it right, it's fucking amazing. So also getting a a coach to leave is difficult, but would you see this as a, um, I don't know, a path into the NFL or do you think this is just a, a really solid spot for our boy Lincoln? He's been kind of in that discussion for a long time. Um, because of his success with quarterbacks, because of his success with um, building up that Oklahoma franchise or, I guess, school, that brand. Um, but there is no doubt um, he's still going to be in that conversation. Uh, but honestly, USC is such a, a massive, massive school, such a massive uh, get that there's really no reason to be leaving i mean he's gonna own los angeles he's got everything there that he could possibly need i don't necessarily see him as a guy that needs to go to the nfl to prove himself i think he's fine just where he is um at oklahoma he was the fifth highest paid coach in college football making 7.6 million dollars a year nick saban is currently making 9.75 i don't see him getting less than 10 million, maybe nine at the absolute lowest, if it's a long-term deal, but I totally see Lincoln Riley getting a $10 million per year contract. The John Gruden special, the John Gruden special. Um, I can't wait to see what his buyout ends up being or his, uh, what would you call it in a civil case? No, like in a, in a settlement, what his settlement will be from uh, the lawsuit that will inevitably occur from his firing. Um, but yeah, it'll be a lot of fucking money. And that's what it's all about, folks. Uh, all right. Well, I have no other opinions. I have no opinions in that segment at all about college football, but I, I, I continue to have no opinions on, on 
anything happening in college football. Because uh, I don't oh. follow that cult. It's a different cult. I have other cults. I'm very busy with my other cults. I, I'm with you there. I've been kind of weaning off a certain number of cults that I've had just because other cults are taking over. There's a, it's hard to balance all the cult lives. It, it, it is. It is. You, you can't do all the cults. You can't, you can't join every prison gang, folks. Sometimes you got to say no. Uh, all right. Let's, uh, let's, talk, let's talk baseball contracts real quick because uh, it's been heating up. We had assumed, as I think a number of people had assumed, that it would be a relatively quiet start to the offseason because with CBA negotiations looming, and uh, the current CBA expiring early December, I think at the end of next week, maybe a little bit later than that. So sometime within the next couple of weeks, I don't really know where we're shit at this point in time, um, right. that a lot of players would wait until after the CBA had expired and a new one had been signed in order to actually sign their contracts, because what would be happening with the CBA may affect contract valuations may be able to get more money. They may be able to have more power. They might be able to negotiate better years, better terms. Who the fuck knows? Um, and for the most of what we've seen of free agency so far, that had been true. However, it seems as though the dam is starting to break. And uh, the problem is, or the consequence is, is that it's very likely that once a couple marquee players sign, if other marquee players see that and it's for a value that they like, that is in line with where they would like to be, well, do you risk waiting for the post-CBA where maybe things are actually harder or worse, or there's less money, they institute a hard cap and teams don't want to spend, or do you try to lock in a rate now where you're comfortable? And... While it doesn't, you know, Correa is still on the board. Trevor Story is still on the board. You know, Robbie Ray is the still on names, the board. Yeah. yeah, the 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 big dogs for this one, Scherzer, all those guys. We are starting to see a few more names fall. And the biggest one most recently, which by most recently, I mean like today, is uh, Marcus Simeon is off the board. He is in Texas now. Um, which sure. is a surprise. Gotta say. Uh, yeah, I didn't see this one coming at all. Um, like good on him for what I assume is going to be chasing the money because he sure as hell isn't chasing a ring in Texas. Um, but I just, I never saw this connection. I just never saw Texas as a preferred landing spot. I mean, look, they definitely could use the help at shortstop. I mean, they could kind of use the help just about every position. Um, I just kind of saw Marcus Simeon as a guy who was kind of, you know, he's had such a great season. He's had a lot of good seasons before this, but nothing really special. This was, I guess you could call it a breakout. Um, I just kind of saw him going somewhere big, big, big ticket city type of deal. Um, but hey, who fucking knows? Not my decision. So I'm actually curious about whether Marcus Simeon will be the answer at shortstop or second base because he was playing second in Toronto and had, uh, you know, obviously a ton of success, not just offensively, yes, yeah. but also a big improvement defensively. He had played shortstop when he was in right. Oakland. Um, and it's kind of. I always just, think of him as a shortstop still. That's well, just I mean, me. Which and which is perfectly fair, and that and that's what I'm driving at. Is like, is that what Texas sees him as, whether it's for this season or for the full seven year term? Because that you could say to yourself that this doesn't take Texas out of the running for Trevor Story, which uh, you know several writers had considered him to be a pretty good fit for that team, and if they have Semyon playing. Second, well, this keeps that dream alive. Theoretically, mm -hmm. if they have him playing short, you almost wonder if he's a short term fix at short and can slot back in a second if they make other trades, other free agent signings, if they have prospects to move up in the rankings, um, what have you. But it's an interesting move for a team that kind of has a lot of needs. 
Like, but this is also what we've been talking about with the Orioles for forever. Eventually, right. if you are going to get better, you have to sign guys. You have to spend money. You cannot prospect luck your way into a successful team. It can't mm-hmm. happen. Look at the Blue Jays right now. They have prospect lucked themselves in to such a good fucking team and still have to address many, many positions in free agency. And even then, they didn't make the playoffs last season. Barely, but they didn't. And Texas is, you know, obviously they just finished dead fucking last in their division last season, barely winning 60 games, literally 60 games on the nose. Uh, One of the only four teams that finished with 100 more losses last season, Uh, 17 games out from fourth place. Yeah. Bad. They're fucking bad. But if you're going to get better, you're going to need better players. And Marcus Semien for seven years at second base. All right. That's that might actually not be awful. Yeah. I mean, hey, if you really I kind of see it as. I guess I I don't want to say Eric Hosmer was the catalyst, but the Padres were a very bad team for a very long time. We all know that. They get one big name free agent, which was Eric Hosmer at the time, which kind of started that domino effect of, hey, they're willing to spend on this guy. They're willing to spend on Manny Machado. They're willing to spend on more guys, and more guys are really willing to go there. So on top of good drafting, on top of good trades, you're able to get big name free agents to come sign with you and want to play for you, and you go from being a absolute bottom feeder of a team to, well, what the Padres were supposed to be going into last season. Texas is, if I was Texas and I kind of saw what the Padres did and said, Hey, we have the money to do this. If we really want to spend it, let's, let's get a good fucking team. Like you have some pretty good prospects. They're not the same level of prospects that the Padres had to deal with, but if you want to approach it through free agency first, go do it. Yeah, and I mean, the payroll effect of this is, I'm looking, and uh, incredibly minimal. Right now, the Rangers, mm-hmm. I, I believe this figure includes this signing of Marcus Sem- Let me double check. I, be- I believe this this figure includes the signing of Marcus Semyon. Have the 26th ranked payroll in MLB next season to the tune of $48 million. Let me check. Uh, That's not going to cut it. Oh, this actually might not include Semyon. Oh, no, it does. He's here, but his salary isn't here yet. So, okay, so it'll be about about $20 million higher than that. So that would put them at about $68 million, which would have them as the 23rd ranked club of in terms of uh, payroll. It's so- not a huge jump. No, but it leaves them with a ton of, of, of runway to spend oh, yeah, a fuck absolutely. ton more. And it'll be very interesting to also see, like, how does Jack Leiter play into this? Like, did God, he look this he good? There. Right? Like, does he, did, did he look so good in whatever chance they got to spend looking at him play with the organization last year? Mm-hmm. Whether I don't know if he got assigned to minor leagues. I Actually, I haven't thought about him really at all until this moment. But whatever, do they think like if he makes an appearance next year, do we credit Marcus Simeon to that? Or are they trying to build a roster so that when Jack Leiter does come up, it's a team that is a Jack Leiter away from maybe not World Series contention, but like wild card contention, you know? Like a, a little uh, bit with the what the Tigers did with Casey Mize, but maybe handled a little bit better. Right. Cause I mean the Tigers were not a Casey Mize away from contending before, during, or after their start of the rebuild, essentially. I just, I could not imagine trusting a singular prospect enough to be willing to start this investment, this chain of investments, just because he looked good in simulated games and scrimmages and and whatever you want to call them. I don't know. I'm not in that organization. I haven't seen any of the players in that organization play baseball other than what has been seen on television. Right. Um, 
man, that's just a wild, a wild catalyst. If it is just Jack Lighter being Jack Lighter, but hey, if it is, fucking power to you. Yeah, truly. Uh, Rangers also signed Cole Calhoun, but let me add, uh, who gives a fuck? Uh, the that Mets is just someone who does not move the needle whatsoever for me. No, that is a guy who technically bats lefty. And I say technically only because I guess he gets hits every now and then. Um, the only reason I've ever seen Cole field. Calhoun play baseball is because he happens to play next to Mike Trout. Happened past tense. He was on Happened, the Diamondbacks. Right. <laughs> right. And every time I saw him Which, with the Diamondbacks, I was like, oh, yeah, he's still in baseball. Yeah. Oh, shit. Nobody gives a shit. Do they. I could accidentally no. watch uh, Diamondbacks games on back to back days and still be surprised that Cole Calhoun is there. Absolutely. Like, oh, the second this screen turned off, your existence faded from my memory like the snap and You do not. Cole Calhoun does not have object permanence. No, no, he does not. I close nope. my eyes and he disappears. Gone. <laughs> um, uh, so the Mets, the Mets signed a third of their lineup in the one Mets. day, uh, which is fucking hilarious. So we gave the Mets a lot of shit. Uh, did a couple episodes ago because they deserved it. And so I guess we'll talk about whether we think they did the right or wrong thing here now. Um, and we'll take it bit by bit, I suppose. This might be the easiest way to do it. So all right, let's move chronologically here. The Mets on November 26th, which was Friday, signed Mark Canna, uh, a former, at this point now, former, Oakland Athletic to play, uh, I guess, probably outfield, probably corner outfield to a two year, twenty six point five million dollar contract. Uh, Mark Canna, as a refresher on his stats, he has never won an award. He has nine point nine career war in seven seasons. He uh, bats. Right and throws right. He has a career OPS plus of 111. That's pretty nice. Um, last season, he's his slash line in 141 games was 231, 358, 387. That was an OPS of 746, an OPS plus of 111. Um, yeah, seems like a, a, a solid hitter, a crappy defender. Uh, and now a Met for 13 mil a season. He is uh, also, yeah. what's your fucking age? 30, he'll be 33. So this would be his age 33 and 34 season. Any any concern, uh, any thoughts on Mark Hanna? Not really any concern. I mean, he'll be a above average hitter for you. He'll be a guy who can play multiple positions. He'll be a guy that doesn't make your team worse. I don't know if he's going to significantly make your team better at all. I guess that comes down to the rest of the outfield and both health and contract. Um, but it's not a bad signing. I guess 13 mil is a decent amount of money, but we'll see how the rest of it plays out. For the Mets, they should be spending money. Yeah, and the Mets current certainly have been spending a lot of money. They'll have a, a nice size payroll come time for the season to start, I'm sure. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because I believe J.D. Davis is... No, J.D. Davis is still there. Someone's uh, done. Conforto. Conforto. Conforto's done. His contract's yeah. up. Right. So I guess that'd be the Conforto replacement, in which case, is that an improvement? I don't think so, but at the same time... It would be a fine replacement. I don't think it's living up to Conforto's production, offensive or defensively. But you know, if if it comes down to it, and losing Conforto allows you to sign Kana and Plus, I'll take that. I mean, there was nobody in that outfield to begin with that was a game changer. Mark Kana isn't a game changer, but maybe it lets you get one like another guy they signed. 
Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what their outfield is going to look like next season. Well, here, you know, let's get a little farther into that first. Playing one of them. So the next signing that they made on the same day was Eduardo Escobar, third baseman who had most recently just finished up a season with the Milwaukee Brewers, where he's been for oh, only oh, that's right, he got traded there halfway through. I I was thinking of um, I was still Garcia. I don't know who I was thinking of. Arizona. He was in Arizona for a while. Um, anyway, uh, Eduardo Escobar has a career war of 11.9 over the course of 11 seasons, a career OPS plus of 99. But last year, his OPS plus was 109 on the back of a slash line of 253, 314, 472, 786. Um, and he has definitely yeah. been a better hitter since he got to. Minneapolis. So if you write out his Chicago seasons uh, heading from just his 2014 campaign up to uh, today, he has certainly been a, a much better hitter, a career OPS plus in that span of 102, which is a little bit higher than his overall career OPS plus, but not by much. Uh, he is an OK defender at third base where he spends most of his time. Uh, he played a little bit short when he came up. He also plays a little bit of first base, I would guess, kind of just when needed. Uh, and I also am curious to see kind of where he fits into this Mets team. I would guess Jonathan VR is not coming back, which probably isn't a huge loss. But uh, once again, it feels like a very lateral move. Yeah, it's just kind of a replacement because you need a body, not because you want to upgrade. I mean, Escobar has had a handful of pretty good years over the past couple. Um, but again, not a guy who moves the needle a whole lot. Um, did you mention his age? Did I miss that? Oh, no, I did not. I mention think he's in age. like his mid 30s. He's going 30s? to be. This will be all this. Oh, Jesus. This will also be his age 33 and age 34 season for this two year deal. So okay. both That's... both Mark Hanna and Eduardo Escobar, 30 age 33 and 34 year seasons. Which is fine. Um, not exactly prime years, but not exactly dead man walking. Um, again, if, if he just ends up being a utility player for him, he's a utility player for him. Yeah, uh, whatever. Let's let's do the last one, and then we'll talk about all the big in, one. And in, 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 yeah, unison. Starling Marte, uh, the next day, November twenty seventh, but still within the same twenty four hour time period, I believe. So this was actually just yesterday. Signed a four year, seventy eight million dollar contract to play with the New York Metropolitans. He will be their starting center fielder. That's for sure. As he has been one would hope, but I really don't want to say the Mets are guaranteed to put him in center field. That's true. Uh, but he is a, a, a solid center fielder. He has a positive D war, which is pretty rare to see in general. Actually, uh, he has a career 34.8 war in 10 seasons as well as well as a career 116 OPS plus last season. It was 132 on the back of a slash line. That looked as such uh, three, no, 310, 383, 485. That's an 841 OPS. And as I said, a 132 OPS plus. Uh, he has a two time Golden Glove, one time All Star, and he's been a solid player for uh, ever, forever, I'll say. Uh, speed on the base pass. Yeah. He stole 47 bases this year. He's one of those guys where, yeah, he's been an all-star once, but he feels like a guy who should almost be in that conversation yearly. You know, like he's never had that season where he's gone out and been an utter game-breaking star, but he's been a star who has always put up really good numbers fairly consistently and has always been, you know, top two, top three player on whatever team he's ever going to be on. See, there's those guys that are so good they never get traded because teams yeah. that have them never trade them. And there are those guys who are so good they always get traded. 
because yeah. they always have seem to have value because they they're never bad. Right. And Starling Marte is that. He's seemingly man- always rumored about uh, being traded because he's never bad, and he will always get you value. But he's not like so incredibly valuable, you know. Like uh, I don't know who a current center fielder would be. Fucking well, Mike Trout, sure. Uh, that you know, he's obviously never going to get traded since his rookie season in 2012 in Pittsburgh, and withholding the uh, shortened 2020 season, he's only had one season where he's played under 120 games. And under a hundred OPS, actually a hundred and seven OPS, which even then he had an eighty nine, which isn't going to kill your team. Um, but he's been an exceptional player for his entire career. Um, damn shame that he does not get more recognition in the anecdote anecdote column. Whatever. Sure. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, he has literally more war than both the other two guys combined in his career. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's he's fucking solid. This is a four year deal. He is uh, heading into his age 33 season. So this will. So all these guys are 32. Just finished their age 32 season. So uh, they'll have Marte from age 33 to 34, three, four, five. Six, age 36 season. I always forget whether or not I need to include one of the ages. So, uh, yeah, he'll, you know, he's an a older player in air quotes, but the term of this is far from bad. And the average value of this is very good. If you are the Mets, it's uh, $19.5 million. That's not a backbreaking amount of money, especially if you're the Mets. So between all three of these guys we're looking at, uh, we'll call that 20. So that's uh, 33, $43 million per year for the next, uh, at least the next two years uh, for those crop of players. And maybe now we can try to do the math of what the fuck this Mets outfield will look like. Cause this is going to be a pretty different team from what they had last year. If we go into this also assuming that they have a DH, Maybe that amount of flexibility makes it a little bit easier for us to picture this lineup. But as of right now, the outfield of uh, Dominic Smith, Brandon Nimmo, and Michael Conforto seems like it's probably not returning. I would assume, I think, assuming Marte in center field is probably the easiest one we can do. Mm -hmm. What the fuck next? Honestly, like looking at their depth chart, just as it stands today, outside of ESPN, why the fuck would you have Jacob Degrom as their number four starter? You psychopaths. Innings, maybe. I don't know, man. I mean, their starting rotation in the outfield, or in the field, I should say, James McCann behind the plate, perfectly acceptable player there, pretty good hitter okay enough defensive player Pete Alonzo at first Jeff McNeil at second Eduardo Escobar at third Francisco Lindor at shortstop Mark Canna Starling Marte Brandon Nimmo and then Dominic Smith at DH yeah you have some guys in there that can be you know improved upon like you can get a third baseman for you know replacing Eduardo Escobar you know Look, if they were to go and trade for a guy like Jose Ramirez, who's perpetually on the trade block, this is a star-studded team. Like, yeah, you have Jacob DeGrom. You have Taiwan Walker behind him. Carlos Carrasco is your number three. Trevor Williams and Joey Lucchesi round out the, the starting five. That's not outrageously good, but damn, Jacob DeGrom alleviates a lot of pressure from every other guy. You have a good enough bullpen to get the job done you have a lot of really good players in there i have no idea what their depth is but again this should be a team that competes for the nl east i don't as we say really know. every season uh, yeah again i was just gonna say i really don't know if they'll be able to put that together but they should um i mean <laughs> 
technically they also have Robin Cano still on the team. Robinson Cano. I should oh say. my God, they do. Is he going to ever show up in baseball again? Um, is he well, still suspended? No, I don't think he is. I think this year was the last of his suspension. Um, is he going to be good if he comes back? He won't have to play the field anymore. That might help. If, assuming a world in which the National League has the DH, which all signs point to, yes. On that. I don't want to look at your career stats, Mr. Robinson Cano, because my goodness, they're definitely going to be better than it was the last time he played. I guess I can just Google him. Robinson Cano, you were so good when I first started watching baseball. Yeah, he has a career 69.6 war. Wow, it's really? So fucking, yeah. Like, he would have been a Hall of Famer. 2020, he had a 143 OPS plus. Holy shit. He was actually still really good at baseball. He's been really good at baseball. Never stopped. Wow. Okay, Robinson Cano, you've always been really good in my mind, but you are actually a lot better than I remember. So good on you. Yeah, yeah, uh, he's very fucking good. So that's what I'm saying. Like, does that mean There's your potential third baseman, by the way? No, Bobby Cano's not playing fucking third. <laughs> so but that's what I'm saying. Like, old. <laughs> like who? People got to move. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't think yeah. if the Mets are want to continue signing players, which they probably should, I would imagine some guys are probably going to hit hit the block. Uh, it's just a question of fucking who. Uh, they're definitely gonna, first off, they're definitely going to sign more bullpen arms. Aaron Loop was their absolute best uh, guy out of the pen last season. And now he's an angel. So. You got to fucking figure that shit out, but it's it's an interesting sequence of moves for guys that everything everyone universally went like oh, to uh, after it happened, which is only interesting because the Mets got publicly very frustrated by two players not signing with them, and then went on a spending spree. And while their spending spree honestly feels pretty reasonable, uh, it, it also doesn't inspire great confidence. The Starling Marte signing is really cool, but this feels. Mm-hmm. This feels like what the like 05 Yankees would do, which is, ah, here's a guy that was uh, solid somewhere else and we'll give him maybe a little bit more money than other teams would have, but maybe not by too much, but definitely more money to Mm -hmm. patch a hole for a season or two while we try to figure something else out. And uh, it didn't really work out very well for, for the Yankees when they tried doing that. So I don't have much hope for the Mets succeeding in that department either. You can just stop after I don't have much hope for the Mets. That's all you really need to say. Uh, What else is there to say? But the Mets are not the only ones who have been active in the free agent market. Uh, The fucking Rays signed Corey Kluber today to a one year, $8 million contract, which is interesting. Something. It's certainly something. Uh, as we all know, Corey Klub's Klub, Klubot. The Klubot. Klub, Klub dog. Jinx. Uh, he was with the Yankees last season where he had himself a pretty good year. He threw a no hitter. Um, that's pretty cool. Do we have a total number of no hitters from this past season? 75. Oh, I you had me for like a third of a second. That's enough. That's enough to make it. It was very, very close to saying that's not possible, which is correct. It is not. There's no way. Uh, Corey Kluber war last season with the Yankees in uh, 16 games over under one. Under over 1.4. Damn. Good on you, Klubot. Well, one of them has to be the no hitter, <laughs> but yeah, I was basically thinking how much war can a no hitter get you? And then I felt like the rest was going to be a relative wash. So uh, technically is... a, a no hitter should be what one in well, theory, but... maybe should point be... nine. It should be less than one because the no hitter requires a lot of really good defense. 
Because you got to think sure, that yeah. if we think about each individual win as like a as like a chunk of war to be distributed percentage based around the team, you know, the pitcher will probably have a decent share of it if it's a zero sum situation. But like if your shortstop saves your balls, then it's like, all right, he gets he's going to get a pretty big share. That was definitely a hit. How do you even jump that high? It was going to be that kind of thing. Uh, because Fernando Tatis has upgraded to double jump. Yeah, that's true. It'll be interesting to see how Corey Kluber pitches with the Rays. And I don't mean in terms of the usual stats that we quote ERA and, and you know, FIP and whatever other bullshit we decide to, you know, dredge up for the day. I mean, like, what will they have him do? Because the Rays, as we've discussed a lot of the past couple of years, don't just make guys good. They have guys throw like one to two pitches in particular, and that's that pitch guy. They're not just bringing in reliever number three. They're bringing in curveball guy. They're not just bringing in reliever number two. Kluber. They're bringing in slider guy. And so it'll be interesting Kluber. to see how Kluber is deployed in that way because I don't think they're going to give him even the relatively lessened standard looking uh, starter role that the Yankees gave him with just a really short leash. And he's almost like a bulk mm-hmm. guy. Uh, I, I would imagine that the Rays are probably going to give him a starting role where he throws starting. very right. Big old air quotes uh, where he throws very specific pitches for not a long time. That's my guess, but Hey, I mean, we'll see. I was going to say I, I would see him in a very similar role. Um, I really, really hope they don't diminish him to the quote-unquote closer role. Um, or not closer role, opener role. Um, I don't know. I know the Rays are going to do him well. <sighs> Phrasing. They're going to do well by him. In the um, butt. In the butt. Uh, hard uh, and without lubricant, but I I just hope that it's I don't know I just hope they don't fuck with them too much because hey I used to be an Indians fan you know back in the day I still want to see Corey Kluber go down in uh, in style. That was just a whole lot of phrasing in that one. Just want to see Corey uh, Kluber go is. down in style. What with like whips and chains. Uh- <laughs> So seriously, are we not doing phrasing? Uh, other signing, I know what you're thinking. We're getting to the, the big one. We'll close out on it. Avisail Garcia, who has spent the last several seasons with uh, Milwaukee, several meaning two. Uh, oh my god, oh, he's been around for, for fucking 10 years. Wow, it does not feel like it. Um, what. Yeah, he's he just finished his age 30 season. Avisayo Garcia, who has career 10.9 war, last season 2.9 with a 117 OPS plus, career OPS plus of 105, uh, but definitely much higher than that in his last uh, five seasons as he's averaged a 114 OPS plus in the last five seasons. Um, his last year in Milwaukee, mostly playing right field, he had a slash line of 262, 330, 490, an OPS of 820. It's an OPS plus of 117. And uh, four years, $53 million to go play in Miami. And uh, I'll it makes you wonder, it. is this the beginning? Is this the beginning of uh, Miami trying to fuck around and find out? That'd be fun. Uh, I, I don't think I'm willing to put that label on Abisel Garcia. Um, I am again. Uh, okay, sure. Go right ahead. It's your label. You can put it on however you like. Um, Ooh. <laughs> um if you had put Abisel Garcia on the Marlins last year, his OPS plus would be the second highest on the entire team. His OPS plus was 117. It's not crazy high. It would be the second highest on the entire team. 
is really not good. Like, really, really not good. Yeah. And, you know, the Marlins have a mean-looking rotation. Sandy Alcantara looks like the real deal. Trevor Rogers had a solid, great fucking rookie season. Pablo Lopez agreed. Pablo Lopez looked fucking great. Zach Thompson played fucking great. Jesus Lozardo is there. We'll see what he does with a more present, um, more opportunities to be a starter and and a full off season and spring training with the Marlin staff, which is clearly shown to develop pitching really, really well. Um, mm-hmm. They also have some guy named Eliezer Hernandez who seemed to have had a fine season with them last year. So pitching wise, they're fucking, they're fucking good, man. Set. They just need batting. They, they really just need batting. And, you know, last season, uh, they had a man by the name of Sterling Marte in center field, and he's not in center field anymore. Then last season, they had a man named Adam Duvall play right field, and he's not he's not there anymore. Those two guys got traded in the offseason or in the, uh, before the trade deadline, and you need somebody to do it. Lewis Brinson shouldn't be allowed to do it. So, uh, you know, even though this is just replacing Adam Duvall, that's totally fucking fine. You can have Jesus Sanchez slot in there somewhere as well. Uh, but this is hard to look at this as anything other than a, a pretty big upgrade, even over the, just the production Adam Duvall gave you, let alone the production Corey Dickerson is uh, sucking off the field. So it counts for something. Uh, man, I think they need to go after guys like serious game changers, you know, that you could probably get at a bargain either because of injury or lack of production. Um, JT Real Muto, you know, best catcher in the game, you know, John Carlos Stanton after being out for so long, Yelich after a down season, like those guys would really make the Marlins a game changer. Suck a dick. I uh, usually do. So that brings us to the last uh, major contract signing that happened in MLB this past week. And that is today. Uh, Actually, Byron Buxton signed a seven-year, $100 million contract with the Minnesota Twins. He's been a career twin. However, he has but one season of over 100 games played. That's it. He has seven seasons there. One time he's gotten over 140 games in a season. So he has 16.2 career war, 102 career OPS plus with a, uh, but this past season, he tore the fucking roof off the place, four and a half war in only 60 games and a 171 OPS plus. Wasn't he on pace for like 15 war to start the season? It was ridiculous. Like something it was fucking ludicrous. Stupid. Yeah. I yeah, mean, it was, I, I get that you're basically signing him to a contract that you it's a discounted rate for what he would get. I would assume typically based on the assumption that you're never going to play a full season. So we're going to pay you on the fact that we're only really going to get you for probably at best a hundred games, which when it comes down to it, I feel like, what was it? Seven and a half million, 10 million, a uh, hundred million. It was a hundred million over seven years. Yes. So math, that's like what, 12 and a half? Oh, uh, honestly, I don't even have that in front of me. Hold on. Uh, 100 divided by seven, 14.2. 14. 14. I suck at math. Um, that's a pretty great deal. Yeah, I mean, I think obviously. Both sides are very happy with this deal. Right. Give, one give of those him- rare win wins. Given uh, Buxton's ability to produce, you might say that's a little bit low in terms of dollars, only $100 million, but his inability to stay on the field has been a colossal hindrance to that. So this is pretty fair. Seven years gives him enough cushion that he can not worry if he ends up having nagging injuries for the first couple of years and needs to take time and not be pressed about having production meet up to the contract. Obviously, it means that he also, if he ends up tearing the roof off the joint in the first three years and never sees the aisle again, that he he gets hosed a little bit. But, uh, I mean, you know, the risk is involved with a guy who can't stay on the field or has has proved that 
hasn't proved otherwise yet in his tenure with the team. So it's 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 fair. It's also almost certainly yeah. takes him off the uh, the trade rumors, at least for the immediate. Now that this is a cumbersome contract, just that you'd imagine the twins wouldn't give it out if they weren't playing on sticking with him. That would be some strategy. Y- yeah. So anyway, uh, football's being played. I, I'd rather like go to sleep. Steelers fucking suck, by the way. Just like. So my person and I were out shopping. Uh, they're a Bengals fan. I'm a Steelers fan. Uh, we, we made a gamble on the game. Um, we left to go run some errands and uh, Joe Burrow ran it in for a touchdown right before we left. It's like, all right, that's fine. You know, it's early on in the game. There's plenty of time. The next time we checked the score, it was 41 to three. Uh, I get the Steelers are bad this year. They've outplayed their record, which they seem to do every year, or they've underperformed their record, uh, which they seem to do every year. Um, I, the, they suck, whatever. Yeah, the Jets won today, and I didn't even care. So, But we'll talk about it yeah. later because I, I got to go. Um, I feel you. Yeah, yeah, I'm falling apart over here. So, uh, if you want to follow the show on Twitter, you can do so at Juicing Pod. If you'd like to follow Corwin on Twitter, you can do so at Corwin Heller. If you'd like to follow myself on Twitter, you can do so at Joshua D. Tracy. And if you'd like to send emails to the show, you can do so at juicing the numbers at gmail.com. And until Thursday, y'all have a good one. <laughs>